This video is sponsored by Raycon. Imagine, if you will, that you're living life as part of the prototypical American dream family. A wife in a nice sweater and sensible shoes. A father, clean cut, and khaki chinos. Actually, while doing this narration, I just pictured the husband being Subway Jared, so that messed the whole thing up. Well, actually, you're the one imagining yourself, so you're a Subway Jared, or you married the Subway Jared, it's not my problem. Better luck next time, I guess. Anyway, let's start over. Imagine, if you will, you've got a family that looks like it came out of a Land's End catalog. Good looking spouse, two and a half kids, nice suburban home with a white picket fence and a big green yard. And in that yard, a happy, healthy Labrador Retriever. Playful, energetic, jumps up on you every day when you come home from work. But then one day, you notice something's off. Your once playful friend starts acting strange. His energy is low, he suddenly seems fearful of people for no reason. Clearly, something is wrong so you take him to the vet and you're not prepared for what the vet has to say. It's so shocking that you absolutely must post it on Reddit. I think my teenage son may have sodomized our dog. I'm not sure what to do. Help me, Reddit. This is the story of Colby 2012. On April 9th of 2012, a Reddit user made a now infamous post with a throwaway account named Concerned Dad 1965. In the post, he describes how his seven year old lab, Colby, had a sudden strange shift in personality. He was no longer the playful, energetic dog he once was. He was now timid and fearful of people, even his own family. At first, he thought the dog was sick, so he brought him to the vet. And that's where he had a shocking revelation. You see, as it turns out, the dog's anus had been damaged in such a way that suggested it had been sodomized. In fact, the vet could not conceive of any other possible way these injuries were sustained. So Concerned Dad starts mentally going through the list of people who might have had access to the dog. The neighbors. The gardeners. His own family? He only lived with his wife and his teenage son. Surely neither of them had anything to do with it, right? He had a sinking feeling that his son was involved, so he had to alleviate that by searching his room. I didn't really know what I was expecting to find, and I didn't really find anything in there that screamed guilty, until I decided to check his browser history. I found he had been on a bestiality forum recently, and a site with pictures of that sort of thing. I felt like I was going to throw up. Now I know that this isn't definitive proof of anything, but it sure doesn't look good. The more I think about it, the more I am convinced my son had been sodomizing our dog. I haven't told my wife yet or done anything about it. I have not left him alone with the dog since. I am totally confused and upset, and don't really know how to proceed with this. Reddit, please, please help. Reddit quickly came with advice. I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to put him down. And then find a good therapist for the dog. Talk with your son. Tell him that he raped a member of your family by raping the dog. Use analogies, no pun intended. No pun achieved? I, I guess anal agis? To tell him how it is like him raping his mother. People pointed out that he had no smoking gun here, but the bestiality forms are really, really strong circumstantial evidence. So Concerned Dad decided to confront his son about it. Privately, without his mother knowing about it. And that decision right there, not telling the wife about it, was the domino that would lead to a long chain of consequences. He waited until his wife went to bed and then Concerned Dad went to his son's room. He brought up what the vet had told him and the son acted nervous, but pretended he didn't know anything about it. And when the son brought up the websites and the bestiality forums, the son became indignant, outraged that his father would violate his privacy in such a way. And after some back and forth, the son finally admits that the week prior, he had shoved his fingers up the dog's butt and inserted the hairbrush into it. Concerned Dad was relieved to hear that his son hadn't actually had sex with the dog, but still, something had to be done. So they came to an agreement. The son would go to therapy and they would come up with an alternate explanation and keep it a secret from his mother. Concerned Dad was starting to think that maybe it would be a good idea to go back on his promise to his son and tell his wife what was going on, but ultimately he didn't. And then two months later, Concerned Dad makes another post. I am the father and redditor whose son sodomized our dog with a hairbrush two months ago. He's done it again and I don't know what to do. Please help. 
This time, he caught the son in the backyard with the dog, grabbing its genitals while playing. Obviously not as bad as sodomizing the dog, but still not good. At this point, the son had been going to therapy, but I guess it wasn't doing good enough. So he immediately grounds his son and then goes on Reddit to ask what he should do while he waits for his wife to come home. Maybe the dog is partially to blame. What was it wearing at the time? In general, the consensus was that he has to find the new home for Colby. This isn't a situation where all of a sudden this is all just gonna turn off like a light switch after a little bit of therapy and in the meantime the dog is not safe in their home. Concerned Dad updates the thread after his wife gets home. He finally told her everything after keeping her in the dark for two months and she's a little bit upset to hear that her son had been molesting the dog. But she also felt betrayed that he would hide such a thing from her, especially for so long. So she grabs her purse and walks out. His son was also mad at him that he told her what had happened, but really, you've been molesting a dog, you don't really have a leg to stand on here. So, with his house burning down around him, Concerned Dad does what any man would do. Continue to post on Reddit. Update 2. Wow, front page. Time passed, some posts were made, and eventually Concerned Dad's wife called him. Update 3. Okay, well, my wife called me to say she is staying at her sister's house tonight to clear her head. She has finally calmed down a bit, but said she doesn't think she can handle all of this tonight. I said I understood and apologized again profusely for not telling her sooner. I tried to explain what another Redditor mentioned about how the first incident was a weird male adolescent sexual thing and he was embarrassed and thought he could confide in me and trust me. She was pretty unmoved by that argument and thinks I should have told her. I guess I was wrong. When we got off the phone, I said I love you and she just hung up. This is probably up there as my worst day in recent memory. At least since the day I found out my son sodomized my dog for the first time. As for my son, I have seen no sign of him since he made his hot pocket. However, for about 40 minutes now, I've been hearing what I am guessing is dubstep coming from his room. I don't know. I'm too old to even want to know. Colby will sleep in my room tonight, and tomorrow, hopefully, the wife will be calm enough to discuss what to do with him. She loves that dog a lot. I'm not sure how she is going to want to move forward with all of this. For my part, I can already think of two families we know that would probably be happy to take the Colpster. Jesus, what a day. Thanks, Reddit. Another two months would pass without Reddit hearing from Concerned Dad, but goddamn, those are an action-packed two months. The third Colby post would come in August. Update, I am the father and Redditor whose teenage son sodomized our family dog Colby. It's been two months since the latest incident and my family is falling apart. More inside. Remember what I said about the initial decision to not tell his wife and how that was the domino that would send things tumbling down? Well, now the wife thinks the son is innocent and in fact it had been the father who was the one sodomizing the dog all along. Clearly this is a marriage that cannot be salvaged so they have a trial separation with the dad staying at his friend's house and with Colby staying with his wife and son. Obviously concerned dad did everything he could to get the dog to go with them to which his wife responded, why so you can sodomize him again and blame it on your son you sick fuck? So he goes to his friend's house without the dog and contemplates how his son could do this to him. This whole thing has just become a complete nightmare. I've tried to confront my son about denying what he did to his mom and he won't even talk to me and has just started taking the stance that I'm crazy. I guess he thought he saw a way out of all this and decided to just throw his dad under the bus. That is probably the most hurtful part of this entire ordeal to be honest. I'm used to having my wife be a complete bitch to me at this point, but the betrayal by my son, who I was only trying to help, is like a knife in my heart. That being said, I have to remind myself he's just a kid in an awkward situation and try not to hold it against him. After all, if my wife and I wind up with a divorce down the road, he is going to be the only thing I love, so I am trying not to do irreparable damage to our relationship. I feel like I've done enough damage to this family, and all of this over a goddamn Labrador. He asked for advice from anybody on Reddit who had been in a similar situation, but I mean, come on. Most of the advice people gave was to simply lawyer up and get ready. And there was a good bit of advice to try and have follow-ups with the original vet because now, with the father out of the picture, if the same thing were to happen to the dog, we know who's doing it. Unless, of course, you know, Concerned Dad secretly broke into the house just so he could rape the dog. 
The last of these threads created by Concerned Dad was made on September 14th. I am the father slash redditor who lost his family after it came to light that my son was sexually abusing our dog, Colby. I have some good news for everyone. Colby is safe. But there is still the question of what to do with my son. In the time that it elapsed, he tried to convince his son to come clean about everything that he had done. But after that first phone conversation that they had, the son simply stopped answering his calls. So after he had finally had enough, he goes back to the family house, bangs on the door, and winds up in a big screaming match with his wife. This screaming match culminates in a scene where the neighbors are watching them fight as the wife yells, Dog fucker, dog fucker, dog fucker at him. So he leaves. As I walked back to my car, fuming, I looked back at the house and saw my son staring at me from the second story window with a blank look on his face. I stared at him and shook my head in disappointment, but he didn't change his expression. I have to admit, that really broke my heart and pissed me off. A few days later, Concerned Dad is at work. The phone rings. It's his wife. She's crying and very upset. You see, their son was at the hospital. He had to get stitches. Why did he need stitches? You see, Colby had bitten him in the lower abdomen. Twice. Wonder why that might happen. She didn't say it outright, but he could tell from her voice that she finally believed him. And he also knew that he had to do something. When we got off the phone, I felt this rage building inside of me. I felt like it was finally time for this shit to end. Colby had stood up for himself against my son, who had betrayed both of us. I couldn't prove it, but I just know my son was abusing the dog again, and I felt responsible for having left him alone with Colby all these times. It was like Colby finally lashed out in desperation after having nobody there to protect him. I felt sick to my stomach for having abandoned my dog with my kid, who obviously doesn't give a fuck about me or any of us, as long as he can keep getting away of his shit. So he immediately leaves work, drives to the family house, goes inside and confronts his son. He tells them that if he ever hears about his son doing anything like this to an animal ever again, he's going to call the police. He then takes a leash, gets Colby and begins to walk to the door. His wife, with tears in her eyes, tries to stop him from leaving. She apologizes for not believing him and invites him to stay at the home. But he declines her offer and drives back to his friend's place with Colby. And for several years, that was the last we heard about this story. Concerned Dad tried to do an AMA on Reddit a few years ago, but for whatever reason, the mods deleted it. The last update to this story actually appeared in a different thread in July of 2018. What was one of the most mysterious posts found on Reddit? Things are better. Colby sadly passed away about a year ago, but he was getting up there for a dog his size, and it was a natural causes. I'm not sure I want to talk much about my son, but I'll say he and I are much better than we were in 2012 when the incident took place. It's not something we talk about with one another. I hope and pray he no longer fantasizes or concerns himself with that type of behavior. If he does, I wouldn't know about it since he lives on his own now. As for my ex-wife, well, she wound up in therapy after losing her job. Honestly, we don't communicate much, but I do not hear good things about what she's up to now. There are rumors of drugs and certain favors, etc. I don't really want to get into it for my son's sake. As for me, I've been with a new woman for a few years now, and things are much better. She has a son as well, and we get along just fine. I have to say, life is funny. Who would have ever thought my son putting something in our dogs behind would lead us all down such strange paths? Sometimes, I wonder what life would be like if I had never caught him doing it. But who knows? Life is crazy, folks. Love your dogs. F in the chat for Colby. And now, all that being said, there's been a lot of skepticism throughout the years, this story is even real. One Reddit commenter put it perfectly, it has everything that Reddit craves. A dad trying to protect his son, the wife who acts irrationally, the wife leaves the husband, the dog getting fucked cause cats FTW, right? Reddit, my kid fucked the dog and my wife left me. Am I in the wrong here? Comment karma gold right here. And they're 100% right, this story reads like pure Reddit beat designed to tick all of the correct outrage buttons. Perhaps this all just was someone's fictional dog-fucking story that they wrote as a creative exercise. Or maybe Colby really was a dog who survived a harrowing experience. You never know with these kinds of stories. There's a lot of questions that throughout the years you'll see repeated over and over on r slash askreddit. Questions like, hey, what songs are on your workout playlist? 
Oh, what's that? Radiohead and the Beatles? You must be absolutely shredded. Hey Reddit, what are some gosh darn heckin' secret life hacks? To which someone always responds, you know, if you want to get fresh fries at a fast food place, you ask for no salt. Then they have to go and make an entire fresh batch just for you because, you know, there's nothing that makes you feel more like a king than making a minimum wage fast food employee's day just a little bit more tedious so you can act like a gourmet over the bottom of the barrel lowest tier of food. Not to mention that soggy old french fries are way better and you know if you put the salt on after they make it it's a totally different flavor experience but I'm not here to talk about french fries today. Very much the opposite. A much more interesting recurring thread on Ask Reddit is one that asks what is a secret that if it came out would ruin your life? I find that these types of threads tend to offer a lot more variety as people most of the time will actually post things that really happened to them or you know stuff they came up with and not just reposts for karma. And it was one of these threads seven years ago that would introduce the internet to one of its most legendary cum artifacts that I guess I've been collecting like Dracula's body parts in Castlevania too. This is the legend of the Reddit cum box. The legend of the cum box begins with a thread created by a user named Oh Gosh Where It Begin. Throw away time, what's your secret that could literally ruin your life if it came out? I decided to post this partially because I'm interested in reaction to this, as I've never told anyone before, and also to see what out there fucked up things you've done. The sort of things that make you question your own sanity, your own work. Surely I can't be alone. And it's clear from the edits that this would become a particularly popular thread. 4,700 comments, 12,900 upvotes, you're all a part of Reddit history right here. Thanks everyone for your contributions, you've made this what it is. This is my secret, what's yours? And that link is now dead and hasn't been archived, so we'll never know what his secret was, but I have a feeling that it doesn't top what came in this thread. And although this thread would achieve legendary status mostly due to the presence of the cum box, the cum box post actually wasn't the top voted response. There were several that came ahead of it, such as, I once helped out my a female friend's family by taking care of their cat for a week. Every day for a week, I would go over there and snoop around their house. I found my friend's diary and proceeded to read the entire thing. I used this information to get her to like me, and she is currently my wife. The fucked up irony of this post is, I think there's a good chance that perhaps his wife actually likes him for who he is, and he's just convinced himself that he learned some trick in this diary that unlocked the key to everything. This is literally the juiciest secret in this thread for some reason. Not totally bland, but not overly obscene. Probably because this is something I can actually picture any person doing, if given the chance. And while it is juicy in a different way, I guess, because, you know, so much of these people's lives is potentially built on the foundation of a lie, it's not literally the most juicy. Take for example, I once took a shit in a bathtub and then realizing what a horrible mistake I made, I flung poo into a hole in the wall. My parents renovated and patched up the hole. So now, there is a 15 year old turd in between the bathroom and kitchen wall of my childhood home. Not even using a throwaway, because I have no shame. It reminds me of that movie The Gate and how he used to be afraid to go close to a wall because there is that part where one of the guys who built the house died so they sealed him inside of the wall and when the kids unlock the gates of the hell the dead construction worker reaches out and tries to grab them except instead of a dead construction worker it's poo. Well, it's more of a secret to my friends that I've made recently. Some background first. I don't like being touched or hugged and I'm incredibly uncomfortable with intimacy in general. When I was in 8th grade, a bunch of girls in my class convinced me they had a friend who fancied me. They said she had seen me somewhere and thought I was cute. Faked the MSN account and they talked to me every night for a few months. Invited me out to the movies and obviously didn't show up. Then revealed the whole grade that I had been tricked into having an imaginary girlfriend. I was mocked viciously by everyone in the grade and ever since then I can't really trust women. I also can't believe that a girl may have feelings for me. Even when they explicitly tell me they have feelings for me, I can't help but feel like they're trying to trick me. It's caused a lot of insecurity, 
and I can't get attached to people easily. I'm terribly afraid to text or message people first because I'm convinced I would be annoying them. What's worse is that when I think about it, I know it probably isn't true, but I can't help but feel like it is. Even though it was grade 8, it was around the time when attraction to women was starting to get real, so to be heard at a time as delicate as that has really done some damage. The secret, of course, is that I had been dumb enough to be tricked. As you might suspect, the whole thing has left me afraid of being vulnerable. To have this found out by my newer friends, as in university friends, would put me in a really uncomfortable place. I probably wouldn't be able to be their friend anymore. Thanks for reading. You're the first people I've told about what this event has actually done to me. And it's crazy to think how we get hung up on these obscure childhood things that really wouldn't mean all that much to anybody. I mean, think about it. You tell a bunch of adults, as an adult, that when you were in 8th grade, you got tricked into thinking you had an imaginary girlfriend. Like, I don't think anybody would realistically hold that against you, but at the same time, it's one of those things that we all have where nobody would realistically rationally care about it, but we still lose sleep at it. But this particular story does have a happy ending. Edit. I know people still read this thread, so I felt I should come back and that I owed people an update. I've met such a fantastic woman, someone who makes me incredibly happy, I love her very much, she loves me, and she is helping me get used to the idea of feeling valuable and trusting people. Or at least one person. She's the best thing that's happened to me in a long time, maybe ever. I'm glad I got to come back to this post and finish it off with a happy ending. To all the people in the comments who were kind to me or who share their own similar experiences, you're always valuable and someone will notice. Kinda makes you feel fuzzy on the inside, doesn't it? Well, time to feel not so fuzzy, cause now we're up to the Cumbox story. Posted by a now deleted user named Lin Fact. Cousin died when we were both 17. There was a reception at his house, just after the funeral. I went into his room and stole all the money that was there. Took some other valuables that his parents wouldn't realize were gone. No one knows that I did it. They just assumed he didn't have any money in his room. Only lose change. I don't regret it but I will never admit I did it. Also, my cum box. I mean, thing, but how the fuck do you just say cum box like everybody knows what a cum box is? At least, you know, seven years ago before the term entered the general vernacular because of you. Elaborate on this cum box, please. Well, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a shoe box, or at least once was, and whenever I masturbate, I come into it. I've had it for two or three years now, I think, so it has a fair amount of cum. It smells atrocious, and I tried to burn it once. What is it about these cum artifacts that it seems like they always wind up burning? When I lit it on fire, it was too damp due to the cum that it simply sizzled and didn't manage to actually light up. Turns out, burning cum smells awful, so I had to spray it with a deodorant body spray just to get the old smell of burnt cum away. It also has some drenched paper stuck to it. That's pretty- <laughs> that's pretty much it. But this is just the guy on Reddit saying things. Perhaps he's just spinning a fantastic yarn, right? Well, he has pictures. And you can see the burnt paper from various angles. Several, probably hundreds of various landing sites. Edit. A lot of people are asking me, why? Well, I'm apparently a rather disturbed individual. But it just kind of happened. Bought new shoes and needed some place to come. Used the box. It just escalated from there. Kept using it each time. Telling myself I would throw it out soon. Never did. Two or three years later, I still have it. It was planned or anything, it just happened. Fuck, this really exploded. 20,000 plus views of my cum box. Did not expect this. A while later, he would come with a final update of the status of the cum box. I often get PM'd about updates or current status of the box, generally a few a week. So, I might as well update this post, if anyone even gets linked here anymore. Current status, I have created life. Mold has begun to grow in the box and has taken over a fair amount. Smells a bit worse, mainly due to a damper apartment, so it does not dry as fast. Hence the reason why the mold has begun. New picture. Meaning that this guy actually moved and took the box along with him. Congratulations to the proud father. I will never be rid of my need for it. I hate and love the box, just as I hate and love myself. Also, 
What the fuck? 2.7 million views. Never could have expected this outcome. And that's what he said is seven years ago. At this point, the album of the Cumbox has gained over 8 million views. And considering how much trouble this guy went through holding on to it for three years, bringing it with him to a new apartment, how much trouble the My Little Pony cum jar guy went through with multiple jars, saving a burned pony, burying it in his backyard after filling up the entire jar. I can't help but think that maybe this is just a compulsion that's more common than we realize. But I guess at the end of the day, that is a little bit more dedication to something than most people will ever experience in their life, so... Kudos. This video was sponsored by Raycon. I've had my Raycon earbuds now for a few years, and I still use them almost every day, just going for walks or working out listening to music and podcasts. The new everyday earbuds offer an improved rubber oil look and feel, nice and slick, and they have optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit. Raycons offer 8 hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. With their built in mic, you can take calls at the press of a button. And they start at half the price of other premium audio brands. But they sound just as good. And they come with a 45 day happiness guarantee. You don't like them? Just send them back. Just click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash wang. You'll unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. If I had a choice in the matter, I would only ever take the biggest shits possible. I mean, it just fucking feels good. You know, you feel like you're fucking born again. It just completely replenishes your HP. You become like Piccolo after he takes off his weighted clothes and he can finally fight at his full power. However, with big shits comes big responsibility. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this story... The Tale of the Poop Scissors. So three years ago, there was a thread on Reddit that asked, If a crime happened at your home, what would be the most embarrassing thing that the cops would find while investigating? A user by the name JoeBloof69 responds, My poop scissors. No clarification needed. And, oh boy, is there fucking clarification needed. Are you fucking kidding me? He says that poop scissors. Like, we all say, yeah, I just got poop scissors laying around. But luckily, he took it upon himself to explain. Alright, I'm drunk, so I'll get it out there. As we all know, the beer shits are the best shits. When I was younger, I only took shits like three times a week, instead of every day like a normal kid. I also ate a shit- <laughs> I also ate a shit ton, so these tri-weekly shits would more often than not be generously proportioned. I clogged our toilets so much and my parents would get pissed. Problem was, these monster shits weren't going anywhere. So I had to get creative. Enter the poop scissors. A nice, strong, sturdy pair of scissors from the junk drawer. If I took a shit that I felt was just too big, no problem. I'd use my poop scissors to chop it up into pieces, <laughs> it's making it flushable. As you may imagine, they got used quite often and poop got caked onto them real fast. So, wait, why don't you fucking wash them then? Holy shit. Like, it's... Even if the poop is, like, staying stuck to it, you just put in a little fucking elbow grease and, like, get it off of there. Why... Why would you do that and just fucking not clean it properly? I quickly realized that these scissors could never be used for normal use ever again. So each time I was finished with them, I wrapped them up in a handkerchief and hid them in a closet. That seems like a recurring theme with these people who have these terrible fucking secrets, that they just hide their shame close to their family in the closet. Like the fucking Telltale Heart, it's, except it's like the fucking the Telltale Poop Scissors. Haven't used them in like 8 years or so, but they're still in there. Oh my god, they're like a fucking, like a... An ancient fucking artifact now. They're gonna turn up in fucking Olmec's temple. I live away from home for most of the year due to school work. Wait, so he like... He left this fucking albatross. This fucking disgusting pair of scissors that he used to cut his shit up into pieces. He just left it with his, his fucking parents. Like, you have to wonder, like, if after he moved out, if his parents just went so, like to clean up the closet where the hell they found this pair of scissors with shit caked on them. Like, what? And unfortunately, this guy never came around and, uh, got the picture of his poop scissors. He actually fucking disappeared for a bit. So, you know, these things, they're gone to the fucking ages.
In Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back, released in 1980, Luke Skywalker crash lands his X-Wing in the swamps of a strange, foggy planet full of slimy green foliage and strange creatures. And it was on this planet, Dagobah, that the young Skywalker would meet his destiny, training with Master Yoda to meet his true potential as a Jedi. 32 years later on Reddit, 2012, the name Dagobah would take on a whole new meaning. But instead of a young Jedi tapping into the Force to unlock fantastic powers, a young operating room nurse tapped into a disgusting infected anus to unlock a lifetime of scars. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swamps of Dagobah. The Swamps of Dagobah story is at this point probably the most requested story for me to cover in a video and perhaps the most infamous Reddit story that I've yet to touch. It begins on August 4th, 2012, in a thread created by Squeeples entitled Doctors slash Nurses slash Redditors, the three most qualified types of medical professionals. What has been your most gory, disgusting, or worst medical experience? The thread was inspired by Squeeples' experience as a volunteer nursing assistant, the story that made them quit the profession. They described an elderly cancer patient whose skin had turned purple all over from ruptured blood vessels. And after two days where they constantly struggled to keep his pain under control with morphine, he finally passed away. Squeeple didn't have it in him to keep seeing such scenarios play out over and over again, yet they maintained a fascination with such stories. Thus, the thread. And it garnered all kinds of horrifying responses from the medical field. A child covered in cigarette burns that his parents swore was a skin condition. A bacterial meningitis patient whose face swelled up and turned purple as he cried blood. A car crash victim whose head came off in an EMT's hands. This entire thread is filled with scenarios that go beyond the wildest depths of your imagination. But above all, there's one story from this thread that's reached legendary status and has been shared over and over again forever on Reddit. The story was told in a comment by an operating room nurse named Banzai Panda. For a long time, I've been trying to figure out the best way to present this story in a video, and frankly, every attempt to cut in some commentary or summarize it just didn't do it justice. You gotta just hear it all the way through. So with that being said, it's about a 10 minute read. Go get yourself a snack, maybe some yogurt, and just let the story wash over you. But anyway, without further ado, I present to you the Swamps of Dagobah. OR Nurse here. This is kind of a long one. I was taking a call one night and woke up at 2 in the morning for a general surgery call. Pretty vague, but at the time I lived in a town that had a large population of young military guys and avid meth users, so late night emergencies were common. Got to the hospital, where a few more details awaited me. Perirectal abscess. For the uninitiated, this means that somewhere in the immediate vicinity of the asshole, there was a pocket of pus that needed draining. Needless to say, our entire crew was less than thrilled. I went down to the emergency room to transport the patient, and the only thing the ER nurse said as she handed me the chart was, have fun with this one. Amongst healthcare professionals, vague statements like that are a bad sign. My patient was a 314 pound Native American woman who barely fit on the stretcher I was transporting her on. She was rolling frantically side to side and moaning in pain, pulling at her clothes and muttering Hail Marys. I could barely get her name out of her after a few minutes of questioning, so after I confirmed her identity and what we were working on, I figured it was best just to get her to the anesthesiologist so we could knock her out and get the circus started. She continued her theatrics the entire 10 minute ride to the OR, nearly falling off the surgical table as we were trying to put her under anesthetic. We see patients like this a lot though. Chronic drug abusers who don't handle pain well and who have used so many drugs that even increased levels of pain medication don't touch simply because of high tolerance levels. It should be noted, tonight's surgical team was not exactly wet behind the ears. I had been working in healthcare for several years already, mostly psych and medical settings. I've watched an 88 year old man tear a 1 inch diameter catheter balloon 
out of his penis while screaming, You'll never make me talk. I've been attacked by an HIV-positive neo-Nazi. I've seen some shit. The other nurse had been in the OR as a trauma specialist for over 10 years. The anesthesiologist had done residency at a level 1 trauma center, or as we call them, knife and gun clubs. The surgeon was ex-army and averaged about 8 words and 2 facial expressions a week. None of us expected what was about to happen next. We got the lady off to sleep, put her into the stirrups, and I began washing off the rectal area. It was red and inflamed. A little bit of pus was seeping through, but it was all pretty standard. Her chart had noted she'd been injecting IV drugs through her perineum, so this was obviously an infection from dirty needles or bad drugs. But overall, it didn't seem to warrant her repeated cries of, Oh Jesus, kill me now. The surgeon steps up with a scalpel, sinks just the tip in, and at the exact same moment, the patient had a muscle twitch in her diaphragm. And just like that, all hell broke loose. Unbeknownst to us, the infection had actually tunneled nearly a foot into her abdomen, creating a vast cavern full of pus, rotten tissue, and fecal matter that had seeped outside of her colon. This godforsaken mixture came rocketing out of that little incision like we were recreating the funeral scene from Jane Austen's Mafia. We all wear waterproof gowns, face masks, gloves, hats, the works, all of which were as helpful as rain boots against the fire hose. The bed was in the middle of the room, an easy seven feet from the nearest wall, but by the time we were done, I was still finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall. As the surgeon continued to advance his blade, the torrent just continued. The patient kept seizing against the ventilator, not uncommon in surgery, and with every muscle contraction, she shot more of this brackish, gray-brown fluid out onto the floor until, within minutes, it was seeping into the other nurse's shoes. I was nearly 12 feet away. Jaw dropped open with my surgical mask, watching the second nurse dry heaving and the surgeon on tiptoes to keep the stuff from soaking his socks any further. The smell hit them first. Oh god, I just threw up in my mask. The other nurse was out. She tore off her mask and sprinted out of the room, shoulders still heaving. Then it hit me, mouth still wide open, not able to believe the volume of fluid this woman's body contained. It was like getting a great big bite of the despair and apathy that permeated this woman's life. I couldn't fucking breathe. My lungs simply refused to pull any more of that stuff in. The anesthesiologist went down next. An ex-NCAA D1 tailback, his 6 foot 2 frame shaking as he threw open the door to the OR suite in an attempt to get more air in, letting me glimpse the second nurse still throwing up in the sinks outside the door. Another geyser of pus splashed across the front of the surgeon. The YouTube clip of David at the dentist keeps playing in my head. Is this real life? In all operating rooms, everywhere in the world, regardless of socialized or privatized, secular or religious, big or small, there is one thing the same. Somewhere, there is a bottle of peppermint concentrate. Everyone in the department knows where it is, Everyone knows what it is for, and everyone prays to their gods that they never have to use it. In times like this, we rub it on the inside of our masks to keep the outside smells at bay long enough to finish the procedure and shower off. I sprinted to our central supply, ripping open the drawer where this vial of ambrosia was kept, and was greeted by an empty fucking box. The bottle had been emptied and not replaced. Somewhere out there was a godless bastard who had used the last of the peppermint oil and not replaced a single fucking drop of it. To this day, if I figure out who it was, I'll kill them with my bare hands, but not before cramming their head up the colon of every last meth user I can find, just so we're even. I darted back into the room with the next best thing I could find, a vial of mastitol which is an adhesive rub we use sometimes for bandaging. It's not as good as peppermint, but considering that over one third of the floor was now thoroughly coated in what could easily be mistaken for a combination of bovine afterbirth and maple syrup, we were out of options. 
I started rubbing as much of the math stool as I can get on the inside of my mask, just glad to be spelling anything except whatever slimy demon spawn we just cut out of this woman. The anesthesiologist grabbed the vial next, dousing the front of his mask in it, so we could stand next to his machines long enough to make sure this woman didn't die on the table. It wasn't until later that we realized that Mastodol can give you a mild high from huffing it like this. But in retrospect, that's probably what got us through. By this time, the smell had permeated out of our OR suite and down the 40-foot hallway to the front desk, where the other nurse still sat, eyes bloodshot and watery, clenching her stomach desperately. Our suite looked like the underground river of ooze from Ghostbusters 2, except dirty. Oh, so dirty. I stepped back into the OR suite, not wanting to leave the surgeon by himself in case he genuinely needed help. It was like one of those overly artistic representations of a zombie apocalypse you see on fan forums. Here's this one guy in blue surgical garb standing nearly ankle deep in lumps of dead tissue, fecal matter, and several liters of syrupy infection. He was performing surgery in the swamps of Dagobah. Except, the swamps had just come out of this woman's ass, and there was no Yoda. He and I didn't say a word for the next 10 minutes as he scraped the inside of the abscess until all the dead tissue was out. The front of his gown was a gruesome mixture of brown and red. His eyes squinted against the stinging vapors originating directly in front of him. I finished my required paperwork as quickly as I could, helping him stuff the recently vacated opening full of gauze tape this woman's buttocks closed and hold the dressing for as long as possible, woke her up, and immediately shipped off to the recovery ward. Until then, I'd only heard of alcohol showers. It turns out, 70% isopropyl alcohol is about the only thing that can even touch a scent like that once it's soaked into your skin. It takes four or five bottles to really get clean, but it's worth it. It's probably the only scenario I can honestly endorse drinking a little of it, too. As we left the locker room, the surgeon and I looked at each other, and he said the only negative sentence I heard him utter in two and a half years of working together. That was bad. The next morning, the entire department, a fairly large floor within the hospital, still smelled. The housekeepers told me later that it took them nearly an hour to suction up all the fluid and debris left behind. The OR suite itself was closed off and quarantined for two more days, just to let the smell finally clear out. I laugh now when I hear new recruits to healthcare talk about the worst thing they've seen. You ain't seen shit, kid. TLDR, don't shoot IV drugs into your taint. That deserves an upvote, and you deserve a freaking medal of honor. Is it weird that your story makes me want to be a doctor even more? It kind of is. Clearly, after reading the story, the majority of Redditors were floored by it, not just for what it contained, but for how it was told. So the next thing Reddit does, of course, is ask for shitty watercolor to paint it. Shitty watercolor responds with an IOU. Regrettably, Mr. Shitty is currently unable to paint rectal explosions as he is painting a series of watercolors to mark the final descent of curiosity. Yours sincerely, Mr. Shitty. You see, while all of Reddit was enthralled by this tale of an infected exploding asshole, the Mars rover Curiosity was making its final descent back to Earth. How fucking serendipitous is it that this video that starts with a, a Star Wars reference somehow manages to circle back to actual real-life space travel? In any case, shitty watercolor would make good on this drawing two years later, receiving Bonsai Panda's seal of approval. Speaking of Bonsai Panda's Star Wars reference, Redditors also took this opportunity to try and come up with a name for this story. They recognized that this one would also be remembered among stories like the Jolly Rancher story, so they had to come up with a name for it where you just say it then you know what it is automatically. And actually of all the suggestions, Swamps of Dagobah wasn't one of them. The closest being the Dagobah story. But some honorable mentions include Maple Syrup River, The Asplosion, and Zombie Butt Geyser. But throughout the rest of the thread, without anybody saying that this is what we were going to call the story, people just seem to latch on to that one phrase, Swamps of Dagobah, because really it's just such a solid pull for what this is. 
They recognize that you could just say Swamps of Dagobah, and anyone who's familiar with the story knows you're not talking about Star Wars. And of course, with any story like this on Reddit, you had those who doubted its authenticity. And while obviously you couldn't verify something like this without a gross violation of privacy, but other medical professionals in the thread seemed to co-sign the idea that, oh yeah, this is a thing that happens. So what happened to the patient after? As far as Banzai Panda knows, she survived. And not only that, the swamps of Dagobah lady dipped without paying, or as Banzai Panda put it, she dined and dashed. And I'm sure there's British people watching this that are like, yeah, and? So Banzai Panda explains further. Healthcare financing is tricky, much in the way that Shilab's lair is tricky. This particular individual was covered by Indian Health Services, which covers Native Americans. So normally we send the bill to them. But IHS requires registration, and she hadn't registered. And because you can't squeeze blood from a turnip, it doesn't matter how many delinquent notices you send someone, if they don't pay, and they don't have any money in the first place, there's not a lot you can do to them. So that lady got to spray her ass ectoplasm all over the hospital, mark her territory for who knows how long, and not even pay a dime. Sounds like a win to me. Seeing how much interest there was in this story, later that day, Banzai Panda would do an AMA. In the initial post, Banzai Panda gives more specific details about his work. I specialize in spine and orthopedics, trauma and general surgeries, but have experience in pretty much every specialty. I've carried breasts in a Ziploc bag, seen a broken penis, it's a real thing, sawed off legs while the patient was awake, seen pus rocket out of rectums, plus lots of other cool stuff. He also stated that he wouldn't give away any information like locations that would compromise past patients or co-workers. He also said he wouldn't diagnose people in the comments, although there was at least one person who was not deterred by that warning. He also had to clarify that he is in fact a male nurse, because everyone seemed to assume he was a woman because he's a nurse. So in a lot of the thread we got some insight about Banzai Panda's background. At some point, he considered teaching before ultimately going into nursing as both of his parents had, and ultimately starting off working at the same hospital as they did. He hadn't gone to med school because he thought at first that it would be above his head, but after actually getting into the field, he began to reconsider it. Although he did have some concerns about knowing just how much depth you go into in med school. But of course, what most people wanted from this thread was just more crazy stories. And they absolutely did get a lot of crazy stories from Banzai Panda. When asked about what his most nerve-wracking operating room experience was, he spoke of a young cliff diver who had burst two vertebrae and was hypothermic from the cold water. At the same time, the temporary surgeon that was brought in for this procedure was furious that the room was too warm to operate in. With the patient still awake and listening to everything, he began to yell at the rest of the staff until they got things in order. Ultimately, that surgeon was reported and banned from the hospital. Another incident he described was of a man with gangrene of the butt and testicles. A situation where his flesh was so rotten that one of his testicles was just kind of just out hanging loose. The strangest thing he's ever taken out of somebody? There's a few. Carrots stuck all the way in the bladder. Not just once, but twice. A man and a woman. I guess that's a more popular sounding implement than I realized. A needle stuck in a roll of fat. And a dildo stuck so far up someone's ass that they had to cut them open and as he put it, milk it out by hand. And apparently the staff all took bets on what color it was going to be. And when asked about what the saddest case he ever dealt with was, he told the story of a church camp bus that was full of kids and flipped onto its side. Several of the kids got their limbs caught under the windows. He worked on two sisters, one of which had her leg bone exposed. Some of the nurses, who themselves had kids, couldn't stop crying and just had to leave the room. But he stood by as the plastic surgeon stripped the dead tissue to prevent infection. Fortunately, the girls did survive, and in a post about their follow-ups, he laments one of the strange downsides of being in this field. One was a little worse off than the other, and she came back for several skin grafts, but both of them went home to their families within a few days. I was lucky enough to be in on her subsequent procedures. One of the unforeseen downsides to being in the OR is that we never get to see the outcome of our work. We do our part, and then the patient is gone. We never know the ending. It was pretty special to get to see her slowly heal and eventually leave us. 
Bonsai Panda shared a lot of stories in this thread, and I'm not going to read all of them, so I definitely recommend if you're interested going and checking out the original thread. Bonsai Panda also took the opportunity to reflect on how working in this field can affect someone's mindset. In particular, one user asked if seeing all these crazy scenarios play out in front of them has made him more cautious in his own life. And he mentioned that in some ways it had the opposite effect, showing how resilient the human body can be. In particular, after being diagnosed with bone cancer, thankfully non-fatal, he decided to take up powerlifting, an interest that his posting history reveals that he has kept up with throughout the years. At this point, it's been about eight years since Banzai Panda's story, Swamps of Dagobah, has become a thing of legend. But much more recently, Vice had the chance to catch up with Banzai Panda, whose name they identified as Kelly, and who they referred to as she, which I guess the name Kelly didn't help in that situation, to reflect on this old story. He mentions that although he didn't necessarily realize it at the time, it actually wound up being very therapeutic for him to share these stories in this way. And with this story becoming such a famous tale, he shared a little anecdote about it bleeding into his real life. My internet fame has had the same effects on my life as pretty much everyone else's. Not at all. Probably the closest thing to an IRL effect, was when I was working at a university hospital in Seattle and overheard two new surgical residents discussing my Reddit story and trying to decide if it was real or not. Neither of them having any idea that the author was standing in the room behind them. That was the first time I realized just how many people were actually on Reddit and how far the story had spread. But anyway, that's the story of Swamps of Dagobah. Gonorrhea, AKA the clap. Gonorrhea is the subject of what is probably the most requested story for tales from the internet. What I'm talking about, of course, is the Reddit Jolly Rancher story, and I was gonna have a Jolly Rancher in my hand when I did this, but uh, I forgot to buy him, so, uh, you know, I'm just gonna edit it into my hand, and I need to learn... <laughs> I need to learn how to use After Effects, because I can't do it that well. If you're not familiar with the Jolly Rancher story, it's the tale of a guy who believes he's putting delicious candy into his mouth during a sexual encounter, but it turns out that he's putting in quite the opposite of a delicious candy. And this story feels like one of those chain letters like the lobster sex story I covered in an earlier video. Which means that clearly it sets off my bullshit detector a little bit, but it also means that we have the chance to look at this story and tell whether or not it's fact or fiction. But without further ado, let's take a look at the Reddit Jolly Rancher story. This is from a thread entitled Reddit, what's the grossest slash nastiest thing that's happened to you in a sexual encounter? I'll go first, and we don't care what he said first, because this isn't clearly the classic story that came out of this thread. A user named Rival the Creator says, Nothing tops the Jolly Rancher story. Steve and his girlfriend Samantha went off to college in August, and right there, the fact that it's like named as he's like this third party narrator kind of tells me this is an old story that he read off a chain letter or some shit. She went to Florida State, he went to Penn, so we got distance in this relationship. So she decides to fly to PA to visit him. He was really happy to see her, so he decided to give her some oral action. He had done this numerous times before, and he always enjoyed doing it, but for some reason this time, she smelled really horrible, and she tasted even worse. He didn't want to offend her, though, because he hadn't seen her in months. This is the kind of trouble people will get themselves into just because they want to avoid a little bit of social discomfort, you know? You can't just be like, hey, you know, something smells and tastes not right. You can't just be like, hey, you want to, like, you know, wash up a little bit or tell me what's going on here? No, you just gotta power through the fucking dead body stench and just make it happen. Can't upset anybody. Can't upset anybody. And rather than say anything, Steve had a brilliant solution for this. He put a Jolly Rancher in his mouth to cover it up. Even though it didn't do much to help because it's a fucking Jolly Rancher, not a mint of any kind, it's just candy, which by the way, you probably should never ever ever fucking do in this kind of a situation, regardless of what kind of stenches or smells or like things you're covering up, because you're whatever the situation is, you're just gonna make it worse. Like they got a whole fucking ecosystem going on down there, and you're just gonna fuck up the whole ecosystem by introducing sugar and things that'll like me make bacteria happy you know don't bring don't bring candy down there she's gonna be like shooting out fucking pearls getting some kind of a, a yeast infection or something don't it's, it's bad news don't 
don't do these things. In the course of eating her out, he accidentally pushed the candy inside of her and stuck a finger in to grab it out. He took it out and put it back in his mouth and bit it. Who bites a Jolly Rancher? Only it wasn't the Jolly Rancher. It was a nodule of gonorrhea. Holy shit, what the fuck is a nodule of gonorrhea? As in, the blister-like structure that gonorrhea makes filled with diseased pus was the size of a fucking Jolly Rancher and the poor guy bit it. I guess it was really dark in the room. He freaked out and started vomiting all over the place when it exploded in his mouth. He demanded to know what was going on. Turns out she had cheated on him at the club, like, the first week of college, and fucked some random guy, and the stupid bitch had no clue what was wrong with her. She noticed a strange smell, though. And now, Steve is freaking out that he has gonorrhea of the mouth and god knows what else. <laughs> Alright, so let's analyze the, uh, the points of this story and figure out whether or not the, uh, the infamous, the famous, highly requested Jolly Rancher story is legitimate if it's possible if this can happen the most important part of this is obviously for us to find out what is a nodule of gonorrhea let's google that shit oh my god oh, 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 oh shit i made myself actually almost puke by trying to do fake pukes oh my like seriously my eyes are watering but no that's that's not actually a nodule of gonorrhea that's a fucking it's a strawberry it is a strawberry covered with melted Jolly Rancher. Supposedly, it's a much more delicious way to eat a strawberry. <laughs> In fact, the more I search about gonorrhea, the more it seems like a nodule of gonorrhea isn't an actual thing that happens. Like, you'll get all kinds of, like, pus. The closest thing that it seems like might be a symptom, and granted, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a guy with fucking Google, but it seems like... The nodule of gonorrhea isn't a thing. Perhaps maybe you have like some kind of pus that gets old and kind of like forms a thing of harder pus, but I don't know if that's the thing. And it certainly, if that were a thing, wouldn't resemble a Jolly Rancher in any way. Like, I don't, I'm sure you've had, if not a Jolly Rancher, at least some kind of hard candy. At no point does it ever turn to something that could possibly be mistaken for like a fleshy nodule of any kind it's crunchy if you pull something that's crunchy out of a person it's it's bad news you know it's bad news even in the heat of a moment even with your smelly girlfriend that you haven't seen in a long time i'm also going to call bullshit on the uh the oh, I, I don't know what was wrong i know i know it smelled but uh you know i didn't think anything of it because a person that has this disease they should be especially if they've let it go on for so long that, uh, you know, it's forming masses, like, this unprecedented symptom that they should be in fucking agonizing pain. Like, this isn't just, like, a little, like, oh, something's, something smells. No, like, you, you're having, like, severe pain throughout your fucking body. So that's calling bullshit part two. So in conclusion, I think the famous Reddit Jolly Rancher story while a fun, gross tale, I don't necessarily think it holds up to the way reality actually works. And I think it might actually be a much older story than the Reddit post. And if I actually do have any doctors watching this, I imagine that my channel, um, it attracts uh, the highest of real-world professionals here. <laughs> um, if you can comment on the, the possibilities of gonorrhea nodules, please let me know, because that... I, at some point, I was feeling like my Google fool was just failing, but I'm starting to think that's just not a real thing. One day, a young Redditor found himself the victim of a horrible accident. An accident that rendered him incapacitated for an extremely long period of time, with both arms broken. This has a lot of obvious consequences. Can't feed yourself, can't play video games, can't wipe your own ass. But another thing that might not be immediately obvious, can't jerk off. This guy's a Redditor. He goes from popping off two loads a day to zero, and it affects his mood so he lashes out at his family. Eventually, his parents figure out what's going on, and they come up with a solution. His mother jerks him off. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Reddit Broken Arms Story. Throughout the years, this has been one of the most requested stories for me to make a video on. The infamous Reddit Broken Arms story. 
Honestly, I've taken a crack at it a few times and every time I just kind of hit this wall with it because it's just such an uncomfortable and frankly criminal story. I just never really know the right way to approach it, but this time I just said fuck it, I'm just gonna dive in head first. That being said, this is subject matter that for some people may be traumatic for various reasons. If that's you, don't keep watching this, and if you do keep watching it, don't say I didn't warn you. It begins on December 22nd of 2011, with a post by a redditor named the Verified Son entitled, I am a man who had a sexual relationship with his mother, probably NSFW. When I was in my teens, I had a sexual relationship with my mother. I think that we would both characterize the experience as positive. Please feel free to ask anything, but I will not discuss anything that would reveal my identity. Recently, my mom and I spoke with a researcher that is studying examples of incest that were not traumatic. He is preparing a paper on the subject. I am not an advocate for incest. For whatever reason, it worked for us. Don't use my experience as a template. I am here to relate my experience, not debate incest as a subject. So I really hope I don't need to say this, but as the poster said, do not use his experience as a template. And of course, Reddit is famous for people just, you know, coming in and telling tall tales that are just totally made up. So you would need some kind of proof for this, and according to Ahmad, he verified it. Which leads to the question, how does one verify such a thing? Verification took about a month of going back and forth with a researcher that verified both my mom's and my identity for his research. He reached out to the mods and verified with them. It was also verified that he is who he says he is and that his field of practice is child psychology and sexual research. So this whole AMA had actually been in the work for a month, not to mention all the time that this Redditor and his mom spent with the researcher. And according to the mod, the most difficult part of the process was simply getting the researcher to understand what Reddit actually is. Obviously, the thread begins with a whole bunch of people joking about it. Did she ever ask you while you were doing it? Remember when I could fit all of you inside me? This comment has made me laugh hardest so far. I'm reading this at work and trying to stifle my laughing. Hey, what's so funny? Oh, nothing, just reading about this dude who is fucking his mom. Do you smile every time someone calls you a motherfucker? Did you get confused when your dad asked you to seed the lawn during the summer? They also asked him to clarify that he wasn't adopted or, you know, a stepson or anything like that. Nope, biological. So then the obvious question, how does one wind up in this situation? It started with her masturbating me, progressed to her giving me oral, and eventually we had sex slash made love. It was a slow progression. This was not a satisfactory answer for Reddit. I mean, this is not something that simply starts happening and slowly starts progressing. One thing does not lead to another here. So it gives some more details, and this post right here is where the story gets its name. Well, without giving away too info, I was injured in an accident at 14 and incapacitated. I went from masturbating two times a day to zero. After two weeks, I was frustrated and took it out on my parents. My mom and dad knew what was up and talked about my mom helping me masturbate. The approached me one afternoon and when my mom said, I know you are frustrated and why you are frustrated, would you like some help masturbating? Blood was rushing in my ears, and I said yes, but I really didn't know if she meant what I thought she meant. I was excited and confused. She said that she would take care of me when I went to bed, hours away. Now, right off the bat, my thought, and probably your thought too, is that this mother belongs in jail. Both parents really, because don't forget that the dad co-signed it. It's pretty cut and dry abuse, not just because of the age, but the power dynamic, and also the fact that incest itself is illegal in most jurisdictions. Like, there's several different crimes going on here. And as a lot of people on the thread pointed out, everyone's kind of like joking around about this, but if the genders were switched, if this was a father and a daughter, people would have a much different tone in approaching this. Like, this is why I kept on trashing this video, because people would ask me to cover this haha -ha funny reddit story, and I remembered it that way, and then I'd go back and look at it, and I'm like, oh, this is a lot darker than I remember. But still, what's done is done, OP is a lot older now, he's working with actual professionals, and he's just here to tell us about what happened. So he describes this interaction at first, of being clinical in nature. Like, I'm just here performing this procedure for you for the sake of your mental health. 
which, you know, it's still not good, but it sounds less not good. And there is at least one guy on Reddit who is just fascinated by the description of this as clinical. Mr. Oglobolo. I read through your comments and I'm interested in how clinical she was initially in her handjobs. If I, for whatever reason, had to masturbate a male friend or family member of mine, I would try to make my technique as uniform and devoid of personality as possible. This is kind of dumb, but my own personal fantasy surrounding your situation is me wearing pajama pants or sweats, getting a large and obvious erection. Alright, we get the idea, you don't need to hear this guy's entire fantasy that he wrote out. I mean, this guy wrote a whole essay asking questions about the various amounts of personality she put into different things, the varying speeds and stuff like that. And, side note, apparently this guy seemed to have like some kind of reputation for this because the top comment is, I just knew you would eventually show up. Actually, wait, I can't go on with this video without looking into some of this guy's greatest hits. In a thread about Bugs Bunny chewing a carrot, I've been trying to find a clip of a cute naked lady making the same nonchalant pose while chewing carrots while going, what's up doc? Had a fantasy of getting randomly abducted by some guys in a van and I'm terrified and my eyes are darting around the room and I see a CIA looking guy pull out a needle and inject me and I black out and wake up in a ditch near my house with two DVDs in my hand. Could be hot if one of those cute female hipsterish YouTube comedy duos used that footage to make an Animorphs parody with cheesy effects to turn them into koalas. This guy's account's deleted, but I might have to revisit him for another video in the future. What's less amusing though is how Verified Son described the escalation of things. Well, the first time we had intercourse, I was lying in bed getting oral from her. In the middle of it, she stopped, climbed up on my body, pulled her panties aside, and sat on me. She was wearing a long t-shirt. She told me not to come and she rode me for about a minute and came. She then finished me with her mouth. My head was spinning. Sometimes it was discussed at the table, but not with my dad around. I would never tell anyone I know. With the revelation that Oral was involved, Reddit lined up to ask the burning question. Did she swallow? And the answer was... A uh, yeah! And as one Redditor, Al Gore Vidal Sassoon, that's a hell of a name, pointed out, the thing that keeps people from doing incest normally is that we naturally just find the whole thing repulsive on a mental and physical level. And another user added that there's an evolutionary characteristic of our sense that makes people who are closely related to us just naturally unappealing in a sexual way. Verified Son responded by saying that he always found her attractive, even before this. Then someone asked if he was ever attracted to his sister, and he said yes, but not overly. And to that I have to wonder, say hypothetically, this woman one day puts these pieces together and figures out that this is her brother. Does she open up the thread, see that question, and think, what the fuck do you mean, not overly? And with the sister in the picture, people were curious about whether she ever came close to finding out. He said that there were no close calls, and the sister had left for college shortly after this began, making it easier for them to do all this. And a lot of people suggested that perhaps his father and his sister also had some kind of arrangement like this going on, but this is something that he flatly denied. In his words, they weren't wired that way. But the dad is a whole different kind of weirdo for being aware of this and signing off on it. In fact, in an edit to his original post, he mentions that his mother said that his dad had gotten kind of jealous about this. Which, I mean, you could have said no, don't, don't do it. There's also questions about girlfriends. Had you already lost your virginity, or was your mother your first? I lost my hand job slash blow job virginity to my mom, but intercourse was with the GF. Bullshit! You liar! You cheated on your GF with your mom. Is there something else? Please, Sarah, you know the only two women in my life are you and my mom. So where are we at with this situation now? Do you still continue this sexual relationship today? No, it ended after I left for college. It just started to slow down and then eventually stop. There wasn't an event that ended it, I have talked to my mother and father about it over the years. The subject is not off limits. I don't think that either of us wishes it to start up again. Long distance relationships can be tough. Now, in his original post, he also mentioned that he would update the thread with the research paper when it finally got published. To my knowledge though, he never followed up by posting the research paper. Maybe there was something identifiable in it, although I don't know why they would have published that in a paper, or maybe it just never came to fruition. 
It's kind of tough to say because at some point in the past year or so he deleted his account, so it's just going by what's archived. I'm not exactly sure what inspired the deletion, but up until that point, he had remained active on Reddit for the past 10 years. A lot like how the Swamps of Dagobah guy or the Double Dick guy used to pop in every now and again when someone would reference them, he too would come in when someone made the Broken Arms reference. And he was also made an honorary mod of r slash incest. Which I naively thought might have been, you know, uh, some kind of support group for victims of incest, but no, it's people posting their fantasies. A lot of people would spread the rumor that he had started the subreddit, but the truth is he was just brought in as a mod and would clean up posts that broke the rules. I have to imagine that a lot of people watching this video who were already familiar with this post are kind of reacting to it the same way that I was when I was putting the video together. I don't know if it's just because of how the culture has changed or if it's because now, you know, the last time I read this was 10 years ago, but I would just think of this story being like, ah, ah, funny Reddit jerk-off story, broken arms, you broke your arms. <laughs> Maybe it's because, like, making a meme of it for a decade made everyone kind of forget how fucked up the story is. But looking back on it, I am completely horrified by it. And you have to ask, why even share a story like this with Reddit? And this is what he had to say. I am new to Reddit and saw the guy with his sister. Apparently there was a thread about a guy and his sister that was popular around the time, but didn't blow up to the extent that this one did. I'm not sure if he turned out to be real, but either way, most of you were not assholes about it. It seemed like an easy way to inform and share. It's a bit cathartic to answer questions. So there you have it. Broken arms. Well, actually, wait, one last detail to this story. A detail that I think has escaped everyone for the past decade. You see, for years and years and years, this has been known as the broken arms story, right? But here's the thing, and he wound up reiterating this several times throughout the years. This guy never actually broke his arms. What he said was his injuries incapacitated him and made him lose use of his arms. It's a very subtle difference, but considering that we literally all call this the broken arm story, it's kind of an important difference. Maybe there's like a different Mandela Effect universe version of this where he did break his arm. It's no secret that guys like to exaggerate what they've got going on down in the crotchal region. We've all heard it before, size doesn't matter, it's all about the motion in the ocean, but we've all also seen that initial gasp. The reaction of girl Meyer in a member that looks like a baby's arm holding an apple. But merely packing heat in and of itself is a little bit pedestrian. You've seen one giant schmeckle, you've seen them all. If you really want to be impressive, you gotta turn it up a notch. Enter the Redditor with not one, but two Johnsons. Because what's more impressive than being able to give a girl a hands-free shocker, am I right? It seemed far-fetched, yet there was photographic evidence. A lot of it. Obviously, I can't show you said photographic evidence, although, you know, there is that one jelking video that's on YouTube. I'm not gonna show you that either, but you can look it up and be like, hey, how is this on YouTube? But I can at least talk to you about it, and that's why today's episode of Tales from the Internet is the story of Double Dick Dude. good meat. Rich and complete meat protein. On December 31st of 2013, New Year's Eve, a Redditor named Warm Apple Juice would hit the front page of Reddit with his r slash WTF post entitled, Man with Two Penises. He had found the image on a place called Hot Meat Market, which was a Tumblr blog dedicated to extreme fringe gay porn. Obviously, Reddit very quickly had a lot to say about seeing a man with two dicks. I really wonder what the doctor's reaction was pulling him out of his mother. It's a boy. Oh wait, no, it's a god. Johnson & Johnson should make him their spokesman. After reading about the horrible gender reassignment stuff that used to happen shortly after birth, he's pretty lucky that they left both. I would be so angry if my parents told me one day, well kid, we weren't sure when to tell you this, um, you were born with a second, bigger penis, and we had it removed. Sorry kiddo. He should get one and only one circumcised, then go around asking, cut or uncut? That's what it looked like he had in the first photo. I figured he was just half Jewish. After the post started to gain a ton of traction, Warm Apple Juice got in touch with the owner of the Double Dick. Update on the AMA. I contacted the guy about doing an AMA and he said this. 15. Reddit wants you to do an AMA. Ask me anything session. Would you? DD. 
Well, I read some of the comments on the link you sent me, so I'm already there. Just not real savvy on how Reddit works. Tell everyone thanks for the support and kindness. I'll take more pics for you and send them. He also got to question the man of two dicks about his situation. Here's more information about it. Yes, both his cocks can get hard, and the smaller one gets harder, but it takes longer. His dominant cock, that pisses a bigger stream and shoots a majority of cum when he orgasms, is the one that is the biggest and hardest. No, he does not have four balls, just two. Size, his dominant cock is roughly seven inches, give or take how turned on he is. His smaller cock, when at full size, is about six inches. Sensitivity, both cocks are equally sensitive but he thinks the nerve endings are more receptive in his dominant cock. He can jerk both off and says that he does on occasion. Usually he jerks his right cock and the softer, smaller one flops around while he does. Best sexual experience. A three-way with a chick and another dude. From what he tells me, the dude was straight, but when he saw Double D's cock, he ended up playing with them and sucking them with the girl. Holes. He's had them both in a girl's pussy and a girl's ass. He's had them both in a guy's ass. He had them both in a girl's ass and pussy at the same time. Ejaculation. When he shoots his load, the bulk of it comes out of his right cock, some dribbles out of his left cock, and he usually has to milk it out of his left cock afterwards. He said that once he pinched off his right cock while he came and the cum squirted harder out of his left cock. Surgeries. He has no desire to have one of them removed. He did have to have one minor surgery in his teens to help the split in his urethra form more completely. It has been ballooning inside from pressure, where his dicks separate and they put catheters in him and did some minor surgery to make the intersection Y heal properly. So again, he can pee out of both dicks. Public bathrooms. Yes, he takes both out when he pees. Rarely uses a public wall urinal if he can use a stall. He always gets stares if someone glances over. He is not single. He has a boyfriend and a girlfriend. They know he's sharing photos and think it's funny some of the reactions he's getting. So basically, hookup requests are not accepted. He has no plans to submit a video. A few thousand people have already shared and posted the pics he sent, and he knows videos will just go even farther. Absolutely, positively, he will not submit a photo of his face. He does not want to be recognized on the street. The next day, on January 1st of 2014, Double Dick Dude would come to Reddit r slash AMA to field some more questions. He verified himself with a picture of his username on top of his two flaccid uncircumcised dicks. I am the guy with two penises, AMA. I'm the guy with two penises, the original post was here. FAQ. Both are 100% functional. What I was born with is called diphalia. I did not absorb a twin. It's not genetic or inherited. I am bisexual and in a committed relationship with a man and a woman, but have permission to stray only with James Franco, wherever he is. Although most of the responses were just Redditors being Reddity, there were a few questions that gave more insight into his situation. Medical professional here with some questions. Have you had urological studies done to see how your urethra drains into both penises and if you have any other duplication of internal organs, like your prostate? Did they offer any sort of explanation as to the embryological cause of it? Had one issue in my teens. The Y intersection where my urethra splits into two had some tension issues that was ballooning until the pressure was enough to force the urine up and out. So they did some minor surgery and used catheters to stretch and open up the Y some. No problem since. One prostate, but it's bigger than average and it produces more seminal fluid than most. So at least once a week, or so it has to be squeezed when I orgasm to release all the fluid. As for the how, I don't know all the details. They told my mom that it could have been a lot worse and that I was rarer than boys who were on record. My mom refused a lot of tests and studies. She didn't want me feeling like a freak growing up and told me I was special since I had two and everyone else had one. Winky face. Do you know if this was a genetic mutation or a developmental abnormality? Also, does having both penises stimulated at the same time feel better than a single one being stimulated? It's congenital and it's from some crazy shit going on during development in the womb. My mom had some difficulties leading up to me being born and they noticed something was up with the ultrasound but not clearly till it came out with two dicks. Stimulation of both at the same time feels good but better when they are being sucked or inside someone. Jerking them at the same time just feels like jerking. Too hard. I usually just jerk the right one. Have you ever considered a career in porn? Serious question. Yes, I did a few years ago, but decided against it. It's one thing to be unique. It's another thing to be a novelty. 
I'd only be popular for so long and then I'd just be another blip in the hiccup of the porn business. The pay is shit from what I've seen, and I don't need money, I'm comfortable now. Besides, I can't figure a value for my dignity. The only reason I let photos out is because I thought people might like to know at least one guy with two normal dicks exists. All the others are pretty scary looking and I feel for them. He also mentioned that he had a book for sale detailing his life with two penises, which I'll link in the description of my Amazon store if you're curious. During this week, the story of Double Dick Dude would spread well outside the confines of Reddit hitting mainstream publications like the Daily Mail and Huffington Post, as well as being referenced on Conan. It's been confirmed, true story, there's a man with a rare medical condition that gave him two penises. <laughs> this is true, yeah, it's all in the news, yeah. And like many others, I thought that was where the story ended, another Reddit legend come and gone. But recently, I received an email letting me know that there's actually a lot more to this story, prompting me to look into it further. You see, long after the story ran its course, Double Dick Dude stuck around Reddit, popping into threads commenting, and people would be like, Oh, hey, aren't you the guy with two dicks? And he'd be like, Yep, buy my book. This routine would go on for years, and over the course of these years, a growing faction of people would accuse him of being a hoax. So let's look into some of these claims. The condition he claims to have, diphalia, is in fact a real condition. It was first documented in 1609 by a Swiss doctor named Johann Jacob Wecker. The condition can also affect the anus, the scrotum, or the testicles themselves, as well as other organs such as the bladder or the kidneys. And in the approximately 400 years since Dr. Wecker's discovery, only about 100 cases of this have been documented. It's an exceptionally rare condition, but it does happen, and with so many people online, there's no reason to doubt that there's some of them out there on the internet. But there were other factors that people cited as raising doubt. Perhaps the biggest one being the increasing size of both penises. The original image that was posted in 2013 depicted what appeared to be two average, maybe even smallish penises. But they got bigger and bigger until by 2016 he was just packing two full-sized Monster Energy cans. But he did have an explanation for this. You see, due to a pinch in his urethra, he was having difficulty urinating all of a sudden. The doctors decided that they could fix this by severing his suspensory ligament. Allow me to explain. You see, the amount of dick you think you've got, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You have so much more to offer the world, but you've got that pesky suspensory ligament keeping it all tucked up inside your abdomen. And many men opt to have that ligament cut as a cosmetic procedure. You snip that ligament and the whole fucking thing pops out like a snake in a can of peanut brittle. The amount you get varies from person to person, but on average you're expecting to get about a half an inch of extra usable schwantz. But I've seen some men claim as much as two inches gain. All that being considered, it's very unlikely that the procedure makes you go from being a smallish to average to all of a sudden you've got fucking Mr. Hand's horse dick popping out. Furthermore, and I am not a doctor, but I have seen people saying that there is no circumstance in which that would be the procedure you do to solve that particular urinary issue. Other seeds of doubt were planted by his often fantastical, descriptive, uh, Tucker Maxian stories of sexual feats. Wild acrobatic orgies, prolapsed anuses, or rosebuds as they're called, because you know a prolapsed anus kind of looks like a rosebud. His medical need to spend most of his day draining his massive oversized prostate. My prostate gets inflamed if I don't ejaculate enough. I'm probably the only guy with a legit reason to orgasm at least once every day or two days. My prostate gets stimulation for both cocks and creates a lot of seminal fluid. So when I come, it has to be squeezed every few days to get all the excess out. Otherwise, it feels bloated and painful. He would post increasingly descriptive stories of his sexual exploits, making it seem that perhaps, maybe, it was just that thousands of Redditors were merely there to help this man get off to his fantasies. The entire Reddit community coming out to stroke this man's cocks. We did it, Reddit. And of course, it would be possible for a lot of these doubts to be assuaged with just a short video clip, because I mean, anyone can Photoshop all kinds of shit and tell all kinds of stories, but it's significantly harder to fake a video clip. 
but he refused, and one particular exchange regarding this was highlighted by r slash drama. It always struck me as strange that he didn't even just have a 3 second video of the dicks in real time. The pictures don't necessarily look fake, but it would have put a lot of haters to rest and it really wouldn't be any different since he already throws up tons of pictures. But for some reason, he's very anti-video, and that raises suspicions of legitimacy. There are people who will never believe, regardless of what I post. The point is, the moment I allow people to make demands and command me to produce content they want, it's no longer what I choose to do. It's what I let other people determine I should do. The bottom line, the existence of my cocks doesn't rely on other people believing in them. Someone called Neil deGrasse Tyson, I've got a case of quantum dicks here. Kinda spooky, actually. It's not that I don't believe, hope I made that clear, it's just that extraordinary feats generally require equally extraordinary evidence. You're cool, no offense taken, my personal position is that I really don't care if people believe or not. As I'm not wearing pants right now, I can look down at them, they're real. No need to prove anything to those who still want to call shenanigans. And as a content creator, I completely understand the desire to not be treated like a performing monkey, but at the same time, the whole thing was just getting kinda sus. And he clearly did care that people were calling bullshit as demonstrated by his response to a Jezebel review of his book. The review, while also somewhat favorable to the book, was also very skeptical to a lot of the claims that were made in it. This prompted him to write a lengthy paragraph by paragraph response to the entire review on his blog. If I were to go over this entire blog post, this could easily become an hour long video, but I would like to focus on one particular issue. Of everything that was brought up in the review, he seemed to have the biggest problem with Jezebel doubting his claim that he pulled out a woman's cervix during sex. The reviewer begins by quoting a segment of his book. You really did fuck my womb, she gasped quietly as she felt around. I don't think that's possible. My fucking pussy is inside out and I can put two fingers in my cervix and you think you didn't fuck it? The good news is that Dee Dee is wrong at best and fabricating at worst. I consulted with women's health practitioner Alexis Paulson, APM WHNPVC, who told me that, first of all, a cervix would need to be dilated and well lit for one to see the back of it. She pointed out that this could exist. She had just never heard of something like it. And that in order to actually dilate the cervix, which a penis couldn't do, you'd need to use more than one instrument and it would be incredibly painful for the person whose cervix was being dilated. It wouldn't be a fun story. It would either be a very painful experience or a possible medical emergency. Hey reviewer, did your registered nurse confirm with you that a woman who's had a child or two actually is more common to have an OS that is wider slash larger than ones who haven't? I like how the reviewer loosely admits that the nurse he spoke with pointed out that it could exist, she simply hadn't heard of anything like it, but then rushes on to continue his crusade to convince his readers, again, that I'm making it all up. To visualize the cervix, you need to open the vagina with a speculum and you need direct light. To penetrate a cervix with anything wider than a stick of uncooked spaghetti, you would have to dilate it with even more instruments, which would be very painful. You would need an additional instrument, tenaculum, to straighten out the uterus to avoid perforation of the uterus. Inserting anything non-sterile into a cervix could easily cause severe infection. The cervix is mostly closed and coated with a thick layer of mucus to keep anything out that's not supposed to go in. Based upon the quotes in the reviewer's blog slash post, it's clear that this nurse was contacted via email or at least she responded via email. Or worse yet, he quoted her as she spoke. What isn't clear is exactly how much information the reviewer gave the nurse to get the reply he uses in his review. I doubt he mentions in the nurse, I looked her up, she is real, that the cervix belonging to a girl in question was only visible after sex. Based upon the nurse's reply, it's clear she was given as little information as possible to provide a quotable comment that would complement his opinion. Here's a diagram of what would need to be done just to straighten out the uterus. Then he adds this to further support his opinion of the situation. It's a legitimate medical diagram, sure. But what many women will tell you, especially ones who've had a lot of extreme penetration during sex, is that you need no tools to push a cervix out of the vagina. If it's loose enough inside, it can pop out. You don't even need to ask me. Just look up porn on Google. Plenty of women spread their pussies open and pop out their cervix. It's not that unusual anymore.
as I said before, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know, but I'm sure there's doctors in the crowd who would love to share their opinion on this matter. Adding more doubt is the claim that popped up in the original thread that I have not been able to verify. If it was there, it might just be gone from the internet now. But there was a claim that the original image could actually be traced back to a French website that had nothing to do with Double Dick Dude. But ultimately, the jury is out as to whether or not this is a legitimate story. And ultimately, we wind up with three different schools of thought in the story. You have those who think that everything he said is true, those who think that he really did have two dicks, but a lot of his story is embellished, and a third faction that thinks he's just completely full of shit. I'll put a poll up to see what you think. As for the man himself, it seems that he is still around, and he's currently working on a comic book detailing his adventures. But anyway, as of now, that's the story of Double Dick Dude. There is a story that is so disgusting, so vile, that I've been dying to tell it on this channel. Yet, the few times in the past that I've gone searching for it, I wasn't able to find it. It had gotten to the point where I thought that perhaps I just imagined it. Maybe it was some kind of Mandela Effect type thing where somehow I had combined my memory of one of Kenny's deaths from South Park with the Swamps of Dagobah story. But recently, while looking for something completely unrelated, I came across it again. It was real. Another Reddit medical horror story. So for this episode of Tales from the Internet, let's talk about the woman who didn't know that she had a half-melted dead baby inside of her. The story I'm about to tell is one that's occasionally uttered among the pantheon of great, disgusting Reddit horror stories. But sometimes it falls through the cracks. It's maybe not held in quite the same esteem as the Swamps of Dagobah story, the cum box, the Jolly Rancher story. But truly, this is one of the most vile stories to ever come from that website. Like, despite me not having a uterus, I still feel a little rumbly in my tumbly reading this. It begins with a post by M. Munir M. on April 14th, 2014. What was your worst I'm so fucked moment? Note that some of the stuff is deleted at this point, and the oldest archived version is Dutch for some reason, in case you're wondering what a Geleden geplatzt door is. So of course there's a lot of simple classic stories in this. You got a guy who shit too big and overflowed the toilet at his friend's house. Many such cases should have brought his poop scissors. You got a guy who texted his boss, can he come here for sex, instead of can he come here for a sec. Luckily for him, she laughed it off, but you have to wonder if there is a little unless... Of course there's some more serious ones mixed in, like someone who capsized their boat. Oh no! Oh no! Oh. And a man whose 60 year old mother saved their lives steering their SUV after spitting 360 degrees on black ice. But the legendary post that's contained within this thread is actually buried a bit further down in the comments. A reply to one of the more seemingly innocuous responses. After I worked so hard for two years to get into nursing school, I came home after my first day at the hospital and realized how much I hated nursing. My wife is a PCT at a big hospital. Nursing students come in all the time to follow her and the RN. A lot have noped the fuck out of there after a few hours. The real life shit that can't be taught in school, poop, puke, blood, chaos, and old guys sexually assaulting everyone, etc., hits them like a ton of bricks. Why has no one ever thought of making first years visit the ER for a week or two? And then, the person responsible for the next infamous story in Reddit's archive of pure filth would arrive. Fatmama923. Note that despite the fact that her name was strangely fitting for this story, this is just a coincidence. This wasn't a gimmick account or a throwaway account, she just happened to name herself that because she had recently had a child when she made her account. So Fat Mama responds, That's actually why I dropped out of nursing school. My professor in my first class made us do five hours of hospital grunt work for part of class credit. I was done. I didn't even make the first hour. I went the next day and dropped that class, and changed my major the next semester. I'm very thankful to him. So you gotta wonder, what could she have possibly seen in that single hour that made her drop everything? 
just tossed out everything she had worked for thus far. The years spent in school, the tuition fees, the long, tedious nights of studying, all abandoned because of whatever horror it was that she had gazed upon. You can't come here, say that, and just not tell us. And so she told us, warning, do not read if you are eating, have heart problems, are easily disgusted, or are otherwise unable to handle disgusting things. This of course was a warning to Reddit, but take this also as a warning to you. And I'll add that if you have any kind of trauma specifically pertaining to pregnancy or anything like that, you're probably going to want to skip this one too. But if you're subscribed to me, I'm assuming you know what you signed up for. And if you're not subscribed to me, well, I'm getting kind of close to a million subscribers, so you know. Anyway, without further ado, here's the story of why Fat Mama quit nursing school after a mere hour on the field. Super morbidly obese patient was brought in complaining of sever abdominal and vaginal pain and high fever. Doctor began palpating her abdomen and felt a mass in the lower right quadrant. She was too massive to fit in the ultrasound rooms, so they had to do everything there in the ER. The tech tried to do a regular ultrasound, but it wouldn't penetrate the 700 pounds, literally, of fat. So she decided she would have to do a transvaginal ultrasound. I have to say, transvaginal ultrasound sounds like a pretty awesome name for a prog rock band. Although maybe I'm just thinking of transatlantic. The doctor and about 30 nurses lift this tub of lard onto a table and somehow get her into stirrups. This was disgusting enough. Did I mention she was a landed whale? Judging by the name Fat Mama, I'm assuming this is a big woman herself, so you know, it was basically just friendly fire. The tech started moving the folds of her thighs and her paniculus out of the way. And if you don't know what a paniculus is, I found this very scientific diagram to explain it to you. One nursing student on each side to hold thigh flaps and one to hold stomach flap. I was the unlucky fucker charged with handing her tools. The doctor had left the room, of course. He told us to just holler when we figured out WTF was going on. So we're yanking on this woman's fat rolls and finally, finally managed to start getting her vagina exposed. Oh. My. God. The smell. This is the most horrifying thing I've ever been exposed to before or since. Now, I worked for a flower shop growing up. I've been to funeral homes. I've seen bodies in all states of decay. I've hunted. I've fished. My grandparents owned cattle, poultry, and pigs. I've rubbed deer urine all over my face. I would roll in cow shit before I went through this again. And now some of you are probably wondering, why did she rub deer urine all over her face? That's disgusting. Some of you probably know why, but she explains that this is a trick in deer hunting. It masks the smell of humans and attracts bucks. Anyway, she continues. Her inner thighs and the opening of her vagina were weeping this blackish brown thick fluid. My classmates on either side of her promptly started gagging into their masks. The tech started screaming for me to run out and get the peppermint oil. I dove across the theater for the bottle, ran back, and drenched all our masks in the oil. Once we could all breathe again, the tech told me to run for the doctor, that this was an emergency. So they're a little more fortunate than the team in the Swamps of Dagobah store, who you'll remember had their entire supply of peppermint oil depleted. But would these people find, my opinions, much worse? Okay. I still have no idea what's going on. I can't see past the mountains of fat and the tech. But I do as I'm told. When I finally return with the doctor, my fellow nursing students were all huddled in the corner with the tech, who looked like she had aged 20 years in the 10 minutes it took me to come back with the doctor. The doctor walked over and started asking the tech what the hell was going on. Keep in mind this fat tub of lard is still in the background screeching about how she wants to get down and she's hungry and when are we letting her go home. Somehow, somewhere, this woman had found a man desperate enough to fuck her. The mass in her abdomen was the remnants of a placenta. Her body had started rejecting the pregnancy, but because she was so overweight, 
she never knew she was pregnant and never realized she was miscarrying. The baby had begun rotting inside her vaginal cavity and the placenta was just floating detached in her uterus. They had to take her in for emergency surgery, scrape the remnants of the baby and the placenta out of her body and put her on IV antibiotics. I know she spent at least a week in the hospital. Past that, I don't want to know and pray I never find out. So that's my horror story of why I wimped out of nursing school in one day. TLDR, super fat lady has a baby die in vagina, smell makes everyone in the theater want to die, and makes me reevaluate my entire life. There's a lot to unpack here. Of course, as I said before, for a period of time, I had remembered the story and thought maybe I was confusing it with something that happened in an episode of South Park. That of course being Season 4, Episode 15, Fat Camp, in which Kenny becomes a famous daredevil, one stunt being spending six hours inside Mrs. Crabtree's uterus. Kenny, of course, does not survive this stunt, nor does a second boy who nobody knew was in there. Next thing to consider, of course, as I always say in these stories, anyone can come on Reddit and just say anything. As others in the thread pointed out, you'd be hard-pressed to find a lifelong medical practitioner with a story this putrid. Yet she happened to experience such an unusual story within one mere hour in the field. It's like winning the lottery, except instead of a million dollars, you get a half-melted dead baby, all looking like something out of street trash, sitting in the uterus chugging Tenafly Viper. And of course, I know that I have a lot of women who watch this channel, and I have a gut feeling that my viewers fuck. So after having witnessed this video, I imagine that there's a non-zero chance that there's a few of you panicking right now that you've just got a fucking dead baby rumbling around inside of you, like the marble inside a can of spray paint. So there's a few factors to consider, and of course, I'm not a doctor, I'm just the guy with Google. First thing to consider, how likely is it to get pregnant without knowing it? There's a phenomenon known as cryptic pregnancy. And this does happen sometimes, often with a healthy child being born into a toilet. Like, can you imagine going to the bathroom one day and instead of a fucking turd, you got 18 plus years of responsibility? It's actually more common than you might think, with some data suggesting that as many as 1 in 475 pregnancies are cryptic pregnancies. And although obese women like the one in this story are more likely of experiencing it, it can happen to people of any weight. As demonstrated by one such story highlighted by The Guardian in 2019. Here's a picture of Clara Dolan, seven and a half months pregnant without realizing it. Not what any reasonable person would call obese, nor assume that they're pregnant. It's not just the size thing, it's all the other symptoms that go along with pregnancy that either are not experienced or they're not recognized as pregnancy symptoms. For example, the story of Melissa Sergikov, who was highlighted by USA Today. She was used to having an irregular menstrual cycle, so not having a period didn't really set off any alarms. And when the time comes for her to have her baby that she didn't know she was about to have, she thinks it's, oh, I gotta pass a kidney stone. And then boom, that's a big fucking kidney stone, you better give it a name, I guess. On top of all that now, you have to consider your odds of miscarrying without knowing it. Also a larger amount than I expected, apparently missed miscarriages are 1-5% to of all pregnancies. Normally, when this happens, the leftover parts excuse themselves naturally. But in rare instances, like this story, medical intervention is required. Now, I feel like you're waiting for me to do some kind of calculations here and, you know, figure out exactly what your odds are, but I'm not really the math type of Asian, but I'll try. Come on, do math. It's probably going to be wrong, but I think this is how it works. So your odds of getting pregnant from a single sexual encounter, let's assume unprotected, we like to have a good time, 1 in 20, 5%. You multiply that by the odds of having a cryptic pregnancy, 0.21%, and then you have a 0.0105% chance of having sex one time and not knowing you're pregnant. You multiply that by a 5% chance of having a miscarriage without knowing about it, and you've got a 0.000525% chance of having a melted dead baby inside you, right now, as you watch this video. Basically what I'm saying is, if you've ever had sex, your vagina is haunted. I know you like bacon, you fat piece of shit. Not that I'm not a fat piece of shit too, I mean just listen to that.
Lip Converter wouldn't even let me download it because they thought it was music. Now you got that good pork bacon, you got turkey bacon, which is still good, kind of sucks, but it's still good because it's bacon. But then a lot of us don't know about it. The women have been keeping this a secret from the men. The vagina bacon. This may not be the appropriate place, but I menstruated this today. What the fuck am I looking at, Reddit? Take a look at this shit. It looks like a fucking ballerina tippy toe, like they cut a ballerina's leg off. There's like a the little ballerina shoe. Like fucking someone was playing as Dalsim and they pressed roundhouse kick. Yoga, yoga, yoga. Uh, it's a, kinda like a face in the middle too, like fucking Kuato from Total Recall. Open your mind. Ugh, that's the vagina bacon. That's the pre-cooked vagina bacon. The top scientific minds have read it, thankfully can't tell her. Looks like the endometrium slowed off into what is it? How do you pronounce that word? Slowed, sloughed. I don't know, I'm a fucking idiot. Looks like the endometrium slid off in one piece. If you look closely, you can see, I think, the hole that went over the cervix. I guess that's, uh, Kuato's face. Does this suggest a failed pregnancy? No. Thank fuck. Or maybe not thank fuck, because, like, that's a pretty promising footwork you got there. Hey, does that look like an ovary? Nope. Chuck Testa. That's how you know this is a story from four years ago, because someone said, Nope. Chuck Testa. Then she takes some more pictures, um, I guess at some point she put it in a jar, uh, then on a baby wipe, and when she puts it on the baby wipe, it looks extra bacony, which prompts somebody to say, hey, it looks like a very thin strip of fatty bacon. Well, looks like I'm not eating bacon for a while. Do you think that if you fried it up, that it would taste like bacon? I imagine the meat is pretty lean and wouldn't be all that tasty without some fatty tissue to accompany it. OP responds, after some pondering, I think I'll fry baby Sal when I go- She'll- Oh, she's had this like laying out on her counter while she goes away to work. Unlike most Reddit posters, OP delivered and she fried up her fucking vagina bacon. Before anybody asks, I decided not to take a bite. I did smell it, however, and it smelled fucking delicious. So I was pretty tempted, you know? Then I remembered it came from my cunt. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. She didn't eat it, but it smelled delicious, so perhaps one of the most convincing arguments in favor of cannibalism, the motherfucking vagina bacon. Until next time, everybody, get fucked. I gotta be honest here, I've never really been into butt stuff. Sorry to disappoint, they just, I never got the appeal. Like, I don't care how hot you are, how clean you claim to be. It's not like you're sterilizing your ass with fire. There's no way you're squeezing your turd cutter into an autoclave. So we just cannot reach the requisite level of cleanliness. I'm like the opposite of Messy Tails, you just gotta keep me away from any possible poop adjacent surface. And then, you know, a few years ago, it seemed like everybody on the internet got memed into eating ass. Not me, though. And after this story, I think you might reconsider. Today's Tales from the Internet. The Legend of the Threadworm Butt Plug. I don't know what it is, it just seems like, for some reason, a disproportionate amount of people on Reddit have worms in their ass. Like, you find one story about a Redditor with assworms, and suddenly it just begets a parade of more Redditors coming to share their assworm stories. One itchy asshole leads to another itchy asshole. Although previously this was an issue that I mainly just associated with Ralph Wiggum. And when the doctor said I didn't have worms anymore, that was the happiest day of my life. Thank you, Ralph. Very graphic. So I guess it makes sense. One that stands out to me a lot, of course, is the Threadworm butt plug story. In September of 2014 on r slash sex, a post was made by a user named Wormy McBumbum. Obviously a throwaway account for this post, although throughout the years he did use the account a small handful of times to comment on things like motivational wallpapers, a haunted baby, and an AMA by then UK Labour Party Prime Minister candidate Duncan Enright. But this was primarily an assworm centric account. So he makes a post on r slash sex to tell us the story of an encounter he once had with an old fling. 
It was a very special night. It was a butt stuff night. He details how him and his fuck buddy took a moment to get really clean first, knowing where things were headed. Can't have a dirty asshole, can we? And then it's time to jump into the action. My fuck buddy and I were getting down to it. We both love anal and toys and all things filthy. So, I had been merrily eating out her butt for some time, and something tickled the end of my tongue. Must be a bit of tissue paper, I thought, so I swept it out with my finger. Yep, white, must be tissue paper. Tissue paper, of course, because of this thorough deep cleaning that had occurred. But that being said, you would hope that a thorough cleaning in preparation for, you know, eating the ass, like ice cream, the orifice that shit comes out of, it would be so thorough as to eliminate any sort of debris, tissue paper, or otherwise. Some commenters expressed the same sentiment to which you replied, no, no poo-poo. Poo-poo. But I digress, you see where this is going. Popped in a butt plug and commenced merrily fucking. You ever see the Coke and Mentos challenge? Picture that, but with an ass full of worms. Then, the plug came out. I thought it would be fun to tie her up so hands to ankles, ass in the air. Ready for a good old fashioned ass fucking. A little white thing pops out to say hello. Closely followed by another. Two wriggling pals, tickling her chalky starfish with their hypnotic dance. It's kind of like that scene in the gate where they move the tree out of the way and it opens up the gate to hell. He didn't provide any pictures of course, so I've taken it upon myself to provide a visual aid. You're welcome. I promptly lose my erection as I realized these are parasitic worms and I probably had one in my mouth. That wasn't tissue paper after all. I sweep them away. Plug goes back in, don't want any more of them slipping out. I turn her over and fuck her conventionally. Dump load and go to sleep, feeling all kinds of dirty. Just crawl out of her ass, she just fucking recorked it. It's like when you go over somebody's house, break something you don't want to know about it, so you kind of half-assed put it back together and put it behind something and just hope that somebody else deals with it later. Although granted, they're still sleeping in the bed full of the worms that if you remember, he just swept them off, so they're crawling around in bed with them. And why post this on Reddit at all? Because he wanted advice on how to tell her that she's infested. Not so much advice given though as it is just people being like, hey, you gotta tell her man, you're being kind of an asshole. To which he responds by basically saying, come on guys, it's not like it's AIDS or something, just a couple worms. It's also advised that she's gonna need medicine and he's gonna need medicine as well in case you know he swallowed one of them. But don't worry, he's all covered. Yeah, I feel like a jerk now for not telling her, especially as I took Mabendazole. Mabendazole being the drug you take to kill the worms. So not only did he not tell her, he's holding out on the medicine, and if he eats that ass again, he's just gonna reinfect himself. I know it's horrible, but not particularly dangerous. Kinda assume she must know. To which another now deleted redditor responded, No, she doesn't know. You think she likes them or something? Funny thing about that, it's not entirely unheard of, especially not on Reddit. Let's take a trip back to 2011 now. Yet another reply thread with redditors talking about the worms in their asses. This one in a post entitled, What's the Dirtiest Secret You've Promised to Keep? Mr. Twizzle writes, My GF at the time had been googling white worms coming out my vagina on my laptop. I called her out on it at the same time I called her out on fucking one of my friends behind my back. I promised not to tell anyone. I told everybody. Now, I know it probably felt good to get that kind of comeuppance on someone who cheated on you, well, you're not exactly doing yourself any favors. I mean, if your girlfriend had a worm pussy, and you've been fucking the worm pussy, that just tells everyone that you've got a worm pussy dick. Dudes posting their L's at the bar. A few replies down though, someone else doesn't feel as negatively about them. Trouser Demon. Yes, it's called a threadworm. I had them in my ass for years. Partly I was too lazy to get rid of them, partly they don't really cause any problems other than being itchy sometimes. And I like the idea that I was keeping another living creature alive. I took good care of her. In the end though, I just took the pill that kills them. The itching got too damn annoying and I stopped caring about the welfare of tiny blind parasitic worms. So you developed paternal feelings for the worms in your ass? I guess I just like the idea of something that utterly depended on my whims for the right to exist. There is a power to it. And the tenderness a god king has for his subjects. Well, most people have kids to get that feeling, but I guess worms in your ass works too. A lot less expensive than having kids too, especially if you leave them untreated. 
So with that in mind, I know what you're thinking. Why should asses and vaginas have all the fun? Can I get worms in my pee hole? OP mentioned that they were in his girlfriend's vagina. I was wondering if there is slash would be any way to encourage the worms to live inside a male urethra. Also, where could one get some of these eggs? I don't like where this is going. Do you have to ingest them or would it be better to put them where you want to go? I.e. insert them directly into urethra slash anus slash etc. Because of this comment, I tried to see if you could possibly buy pinworm eggs online, but I'm just finding African nightcrawlers and shit like that. No way you're fitting an African nightcrawler in your pee hole. Actually, what am I saying? We've all seen kids in the sandbox. The nightcrawlers, nothing. In any case, it's not like there's a scarcity of assworms going around, so what happens once you have your supplies situated? Your intentions are no doubt creepy as fucking hell, but here we go. Pinworms can travel into the vagina because of its closeness and similarity to the anus. You hear that, ladies? Don't get all high and mighty on me. Your vagina is close enough to an asshole that a worm can't tell the difference. Although apparently they do die in there because there's nothing for them to eat. Ideally. They just want to eat poop. A male urethra is not similar enough to the anus for them to travel there by their own accord. So yeah, sorry to crush your dreams here, but there's probably not a way to infest your urethra with worms. Although now that I've said that, there's probably at least one of you that's going to take that as a challenge. And now, having watched this video, I imagine that there's maybe some of you that are getting a little paranoid. Maybe all of a sudden you start to feel a little something, a little itch that you didn't notice before. Maybe there's an itch you did notice before, and now it's getting worse. What are the odds that you have worms? As it turns out, at any given time, something like 14% of the entire US population are infested with assworms. And it's estimated that throughout their lifetime, whether or not they realize it, nearly 100% of all people will have them in their lifetime. Check out this meat. It looks exquisite, right? Nice and browned on the outside, but juicy and rare on the inside. The way a good steak ought to be cooked. Chop it up and fry with some peppers and onions, and you've got yourself some yummy tacos. What if I told you this steak came from a human leg, and the guy whose leg it was chopped it up, cooked it, and fed it to his friends? This is the story of a Redditor named Incredibly Shiny Shart. The man who made tacos out of his own foot. Would you dine on human flesh if it were guaranteed that it was safe to eat and that it was ethically sourced? It's a moral question that a lot of people have wrestled with throughout time. Perhaps even more so now with the advent of lab-grown meat. See, me personally, I'm not that sure. I've always been a pretty adventurous eater and I'm kind of curious about it, but at the same time, I watched that movie, We Are What We Are. And this movie, spoiler alert, the cannibal family develops tremors from a disease called Kuru. I'm pretty sure you can only get that from eating brains, but at the same time, the type of hypochondriac that it's like, I think every lump is cancer, so guaranteed if I ate human meat, I'd be like, oh my god, am I shaking? I don't know, I'd probably still eat it though. But regardless of what you or me would do about it, the Redditor Incredibly Shiny Shard had an inside joke with his friends for many years. They'd ask each other if they would try human flesh, if it was ethical and safe, and they were always like, yeah, of course, no questions asked. They didn't even have to think about it. And then one day, such an opportunity would present itself. I was riding down a mountain road on Memorial Day, 45 miles an hour, speed limit, with one truck and one car ahead of me. Ahead of me, a car coming the opposite direction was stopped and indicating they wanted to turn across the road to the fishing area to my right. They stayed stopped in the road as both the car and truck ahead of me passed. It did not move as I approached. I figured they saw me and they were waiting for me to pass. As I approached within 15 feet, they hit the gas and clipped the back of my bike. It locked up and I fishtailed and then flipped into the forest. I sat up and took off my helmet and saw the burning pain that was my foot. Although it remained attached, his foot was absolutely destroyed internally. Doctors were able to save his foot, but they also said that there is no way he was ever going to be able to walk on that foot again. So he was presented with an option. He could either keep the non-working foot or he could have it amputated. And if you remember back to my video about the guy who tried to crowdfund his foot amputation, you'll know that sometimes it's more difficult to live with a non-functioning foot than it is to simply have it removed. 
And after weighing his options, Incredibly Shiny Shark 2 came to that conclusion. So he opted to have the foot amputated, or actually more like the calf down. He posted the leg pre and post operation, which I can't show you on YouTube, but however, he also did post a picture of his nub signed as proof. And upon getting his foot amputated, he asked the doctor, can I keep it? And in the case of amputations, it seems like people always seem to ask whether or not they can keep the body part. And for what I've seen, sometimes the doctor allows it and sometimes they don't. It's almost kind of arbitrary. I mean, the way I see it, it's your foot. You should be able to do whatever you want with it. And thankfully, Shart's doctor allowed him to keep the foot after signing some paperwork. So he puts it in a cooler and drives home with it. According to an interview he did with Vice, he didn't originally plan to eat it. I got back to my place and I froze it. I couldn't find a taxidermist who would take me seriously, and freeze drying was too expensive. It would have been $1,200 to freeze dry the thing. If I had the money, I would have done it. Eventually, I decided to cast it in plaster to use it as a doorstop, then capture a 3D rendering so I could make little keychains. When we got back to my house, I took the foot out and it was so gross, man. It was covered in blood and had iodine all over it. After I cleaned it off, I was pleasantly surprised by how well preserved it was. It's not like they preserved it in formaldehyde or anything, but when you think about beef, which could be dry aged for months, I suppose it makes sense. I had four friends with me at the time, and it was all surreal. We picked it up and we were playing with it. It didn't seem like it was a foot, it just seemed like an object, not a piece of a person. There was no emotional connection. I could think, yep, that's my foot right there, but there wasn't some deep part of me that felt weirded out by it. In fact, that was the weirdest part, was that it wasn't weird. And here's where the gears start turning. He thinks back to that old joke they had about whether or not you would eat human flesh if it was ethical and safe. And he notices that parts of his foot have exposed muscle from the surgery. So he cuts out a big chunk and packs it away before making the plaster cast with the rest of the foot. He starts to call a bunch of his friends to see if they're down. 11 people in total. And out of those 11 people, 10 agree. Not only that, it turns out that one of his friends is dating a professional chef. So he starts talking about his ideas with the chef and eventually they come up with a recipe for foot fajitas. Here's the recipe screenshot if you want to, you know, eat a foot or something, I guess. For some reason, the idea of specifically eating a foot grosses me out. It's like, ew, you, you walk around with that, that's dirty. But then, you know, thinking about that, you gotta take a step back and be like, wait, it, it, once you're in for eating any part of a human being, it's kind of like why you're bogged down in the little details. It came from a person, and while you're eating it, you're looking at him in the eye. In any case, the chef marinates the meat overnight, and they make plans for the whole crew to come over and dine on foot the next day. So you gotta ask, how was it? How was the bitter taste of the feet? Well, one of his friends spit him out into a napkin and then apologized. And as for Incredibly Shiny Shard himself, when asked to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, that is a fantastic question. On this scale, I would give it a solid 6.5, but keep in mind that I have had a lot of good food. So it's way better than a hot dog or a regular burger. Maybe equal with regular bacon, which is pretty decent, but nowhere near as good as butter steered sea scallops or rare sous vide tenderloin seared in grapeseed oil in a cast iron pan. And the next year, in a post in r slash sous vide where he was eating some actual bison, he quipped that perhaps he should have cooked the foot sous vide. Ultimately though, the quality of the meal wasn't really the point. Although I do have to say, some of the pictures make it look really tasty. More so, this was a bonding experience between him and those closest to him. An experience that helped give him closure on his terrible life-changing accident. The outpouring of compassion and empathy I received from my friends and my loved ones really helped me take on the challenge of this big change in my life. So I was taking care of this body part that took care of me for so long. I was paying homage to it and giving it a proper send-off. I have the ashes sitting in a jar on my girlfriend's altar in her living room, and I'll take it to my grave. It's part of me, and this experience is part of me too. Things worked out so damn well afterward. My life has gotten so much better. I left the town I was in and a job of 10 years that was killing me emotionally. I moved to another state. I have a way better job and I enjoy the hell out of it. I've met a woman who I've been with for over a year and a half now and she's the best thing in my life. I'm so much happier now than I could conceive of being before. And it's because of this time where my life was threatened that I persevered through it. Eating my foot was a funny and weird and interesting way to move forward. Anyway, that's all for the story of the Redditor who ate his own foot. Coconut, a fruit famed 
for its delicious meat and its sweet water just packed with flavor and nutrients. And the coconut is much more than a mere food. It's one of the most versatile fruits on the planet. You can do all kinds of things with a coconut, like create sculptures. Break it over Superfly Jimmy Snooka's head. Coconut can be made into a sexy bikini top. Learn that one from Toe Jam and Earl. And after your lady friend takes your coconut bro off, you know what I'm thinking, right? Oh yeah. You fuck the coconut. You what? You fuck the coconut. Ladies and gentlemen, it's another one of these kinds of episodes. Let's go. Over the course of this channel, I've talked about a lot of MacGyver-esque geniuses. People who cleverly crafted their own ways to get themselves off. <laughs> with all kinds of things that they probably shouldn't have used. It's a journey that's taken us all around the world. From the United States, to Russia, to the Netherlands, and today, it takes us to the lovely coastal African nation of Mozambique. It was in northern Mozambique that a Redditor named Coconut Throwaway 69 had his encounter with the coconut. In his post, Today I Fucked Up by Coming Into a Coconut, he details what had happened to him eight years prior. At the time, his mother had been going on somewhat of a health craze. No junk food at all in this household. Nothing but food that she believed to be healthy and nutritious. And one of these foods, of course, was coconuts. Every week she would go to the local market and bring home a bunch of coconuts for them to eat. Now, coconuts may be full of nutrients, but this Redditor believed that it could use a little bit more protein. Describing himself as a horny teenager, he talks about he had already gotten into the habit of fapping often. But with exams coming up, he was really frustrated and he found that, as such, he was fapping even more than usual. He just couldn't get enough and then it happens. He finds out that his mother is going to be out for the whole day. He's got the whole place to himself. I can just picture messy tails seething with envy. So of course the gears start turning. The usual just won't do, you've gotta have yourself an extra special fap to commemorate this occasion. So from the same type of sex-starved teenage brain disease that gave us American Pie, we now have African Coconut. Or the Cumcanut. He describes his state of mind at the time. Honestly, to this day, I can't fathom why I thought that would be a good idea, but my train of thought back then was clearly somewhat clogged. And we've all been there, right? I mean, I've, I've never had the urge to fuck a coconut before. But I understand the thought process that leads you down the path to fucking a coconut. You know, sometimes you're just a little, you're all backed up in there. And you need something a little bit better. Reminds you of the good old days of reading Jack and World. Learning new techniques like the infamous banana trick. But a coconut is a bit more difficult to get into than a banana. You gotta have some tools. I end up grabbing the coconut drill and, through 20-ish minutes of concerted effort, end up creating a hole large enough for me to stick my porker into. I decide it requires some lube and grab the nearest slippery thing, some butter, before shoving it into the coconut followed shortly by my meat. I fuck the coconut and it actually feels pretty damn good so I blow my load, shove the coconut under my bed and continue about my day. That's how the problems always seem to start in these stories. You unload into this receptacle that you've carefully designed for yourself. The jar, the boxers, the shoe box. But you just don't have it in you to throw away. It's so good, you gotta keep it. So you hold on to it and it just lives under your bed like Howie Mandel and Little Monsters. Which, knowing what a germaphobe Howie Mandel is, I wonder how he feels about the fact that I just compared him to a reusable cum receptacle. So for the next week, he continues to fuck this coconut. He says that the way he drilled this hole into it, he got it just so perfectly tight. It's like the enigma of Amigara Fault. This hole was made for him. And not only does he not clean this thing, but the buildup of his own semen combining with the original butter makes the experience better and better for him. The old loads become the new lube. It's like that thing where, you know, you, you chew up a potato chip and then you spit it out onto a new potato chip so it's like you made your own dip. Everybody does that, right? It's like that, but with jizz. So this guy, he's got the setup right now, everything's going great with his cumcanut. But then, later on in the story, he takes a moment to explain a bit about the climate of Mozambique. Now, before I continue, I'd best mention that at the time, our area was experiencing quite humid, muggy weather which exacerbated an already existing fly problem. Disgustingly fat, bloated flies were commonly found around our house and the exterminators couldn't really do anything because it was a localized area problem that would 
go away in the winter. After the first week, he starts to notice a lot more of these fat, disgusting, bloated flies around his own. And along with them came a terrible smell. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that the source of the smell and the flies is the cum canut. So he decides that, you know, he's gonna throw this thing away. After, of course, he fucks it one more time. How do you think this turns out? Do you think this video would, would be on my channel if this was a happy last romp? I don't, I don't think so. So he thrusts himself into the coconut and he feels something move. You see, flies, as Marilyn Manson once said, will lay their eggs. And when he removed his schwantz from the coconut, he discovered that it was covered in a mix of rotten coconut chunks and maggots. Tiny wriggling maggots. Some of them trying to finagle their way into his urethra. So he panics, he throws the coconut, which explodes against his wall, shooting rotten coconut and maggots all over his room. And that's a mess that he only even ever gets to clean up after scrubbing his Johnson like no man ever should have to scrub their Johnson. Still not clean. Never again. Never again. TLDR, don't fuck coconuts. This post, for obvious reasons, will become one of Reddit's most infamous tales. Easily being awarded Today I Fucked Up's Fuck Up of the Week, and inspiring the creation of another subreddit, r slash Coco Fleshlights, dedicated to all kinds of homemade fuckable fruits. By popular demand, the Coconut Man would then do an AMA, leading to answers to some of the burning questions. For starters, after making this coconut, people wanted to know if he made more coconuts the fuck. To which he responded that not only has he not been fucking coconuts anymore, but he can't even stomach the idea of eating one again. As for the maggots, did the maggots ever make a reappearance? I peed one out of my urethra after washing my dick. That's it. And you also have to wonder, why didn't he ever just clean the fucking thing? As it turns out, much like the My Little Pony Jar guy, he also had greater designs for this project. In addition to the fact that he just kind of thought the water felt nice, he wanted to see if he could fill the whole thing up. Should he have filled the whole thing up, that would have been the end of that coconut and it would have been time for a new one. Obviously, it didn't work out. Better luck next time. Another interesting discovery from this thread, the coconut fucker was not alone in his coconut fuckery. There had actually been another coconut fucking account that was made seven months prior, a guy named I Fucked a Coconut AMA. And unlike this guy, he was a big proponent of fucking coconuts still. Absolutely. I feel like with all the TIFUs, people think they should stay away, but they're just exaggerating everything and making things look hysterical because of the end result. It legit feels like a real pussy because it's nice and warm and literally self-lubricating. Here's a guide I wrote earlier. This guy made his own in-depth guide on fucking a coconut that goes into topics like the science of why it feels good to fuck a coconut. Apparently, if you're curious, it's the suction. And then after this guide was made, Coconut Throwaway would make a guide of his own. And then another more in-depth guide. And these guides include tips like be wary of cock bleed. So if you're curious, you know, there are at bare minimum three guides on how to fuck a coconut. I would not recommend doing it, but you know, I guess don't knock it till you try it. Can't stop you guys anyway. As for where the coconut guy is now, although we don't know his actual identity, every once in a while he still pops on to Reddit to remind everyone that he's the guy who fucked the coconut. It's kind of like that episode of The Simpsons, where a homer bowled a perfect game, except it's like, hey, did somebody say, fuck the coconut? Anyway, that's the story of the guy who fucked the coconut.